think gratitude is really about reframing a situation. It's really just about recognizing that there are events you can control and events you can't. If there's something you can change in your life, go ahead and change it. But when there are other situations, just try to look at them from a different perspective. Welcome to Flip Your Script, the podcast about life's critical turning points and how people find the inspiration and motivation to move forward and rewrite their unique stories. Flip Your Script is produced by Media Minefield, a public relations firm passionate about the power of sharing stories. Specializing in earned and social media, Media Minefield helps clients take control of their unique story and message. The show is hosted by Christy Peel, founder and CEO of Media Minefield, who flipped her script from an Emmy-winning journalist to a successful entrepreneur and speaker. On this podcast, many guests have talked about the benefits of gratitude as they navigated a challenging flip your script moment or season of life. Today's guest is actually a gratitude expert. She literally wrote the book on it, and not any book, the New York Times bestseller, The Gratitude Diaries. Janice Kaplan's impressive career also includes accolades as a TV producer at Good Morning America. She was wildly successful as editor-in-chief at Parade, which at the time was the most widely read publication in America. She's done a lot of other things, and she's now out with a new book on a fascinating topic. We're going to get to that in a minute. But first, Janice, welcome to the Flip Your Script podcast. Pleasure to be here. So this is so fascinating for me because I've read your book. I have it here. A lot of I've recommended it to a lot of people, The Gratitude Diaries. And this kind of made you a gratitude expert. Were you expecting that? No, not at all. As you said, I had been the editor of Parade and I had done lots of things in my career. I'd been a TV producer and editor. I'd written a lot of books. And when I left Parade, I wasn't completely sure what I was going to do. And I was just open to lots of possibilities. And a large foundation actually came to me and they liked some of the cover stories I had done on Parade. And they asked me to do a national survey on gratitude. And that sounded like a decent enough project. So I went ahead and did it. And it was a lot more than a little project. It turned out to be something that was really exciting to me that grasped my interest and that I wanted to just keep doing more and more. And that's what eventually led to the Gratitude Diaries and um, so many things that have followed since then. And what I love about the book is that it didn't just change your life and that now you're sort of this expert on gratitude, but it really like changed your life, changed your life. Talk about what you... And that's so fascinating, too, because as a journalist, you're supposed to keep these things over here. But something like gratitude, when you study that, it impacts who you are and who your family is and who what your friends think. So I'm fascinated with that part of flip your script of just your career. Sure. It started very much as you're suggesting as, well, first, as I said, as a project and then as a literary device. What fun to write a book on gratitude and get to spend a year living gratefully. And as I was writing, I was writing and researching at the same time. And because like you, I'm a journalist, it wasn't just going to be my own experiences. I was interviewing people and talking to psychologists and neurologists and Nobel Prize winners of all sorts. And so I started learning a lot and I started seeing my life changing and I started seeing the experiences that I was really looking at as just being experiments and things to write about as having a really deep and profound effect on my relationship with my husband, on how I felt about work and about how I felt about myself. So it ended up being that kind of extraordinary project that, as you said, changes a lot more than uh, just your your daily work life. Was it difficult for you to be as authentic and vulnerable as you were with your life in the book? Or was that easy? That's a great question. And I hadn't thought of it before. You know, I've never in the past written about myself, particularly. I'm very private uh, in in my personal life. I, I give a lot of speeches. I'm out doing a lot of things, but I don't talk about my personal life. I have two sons and they're all grown up now, but when I was a writer, when they were younger, I never wrote about my children. I always felt like it's their lives, not mine, and it's their stories, and I didn't want to share those stories. 
so you're right. This is the first time that I actually wrote about myself in a very personal way. And when I did write about my kids or my husband, I showed them to them first and made sure that the stories were okay. But my goal really was to bring readers along with me on my journey and to let them know how I felt about things and what I was experiencing. And yeah, maybe there is something as you uh, have experiences and have done enough things in life that you go, why not be a little more vulnerable and let people know the truth instead of always just putting up the fancy facade of who you are and say, yeah, my husband and I had a fight last night and here's how we got through it. And, and that's okay because that's what life is and that's how we all get better and, and grow. It's so true. Isn't that one of the beautiful things about age and wisdom is that some of these things when you're younger, I think you think, well, is it just us? Are we the only ones that are having whatever the issue is? And then you get older and you realize, man, it's probably everyone else. And if I talked about it more, maybe I could help someone. Well, I think also the being honest about my life and sharing my life, I continue to get so many wonderful emails from readers and, and listeners to the Gratitude Diaries podcast. I got one this morning from somebody who told me he was a 30-year-old guy. Uh, we would not naturally have a lot in common, but he was so kind and wonderful in his email talking about how my experiences had had such an effect on him and about how he thought about his own life and how he behaved towards other people. And and so if you can have an effect on somebody, if you can have an effect on a big readership, as I've been lucky enough to do, it really means a lot. It must have been strange for you, someone who's in your old world, your normal was interviewing very famous people and talking to people who are recognized and well known. And now you're the one out there getting asked to be an expert and people come up to I imagine they send you letters. Was that shift strange for you as well? Well, you know, uh, I do give a lot of talks and in my biography at some point, people would always mention that when I was the editor of Parade, I had interviewed people like Daniel Craig and Barbara Streisand and, and Matt Damon. And I would always start my talks by saying, OK, I know all you really want to hear about is Daniel Craig, but we're going to get to that later. <laughs> um, and I have been I have had some great experiences in my life and talking to interesting people and Part of the pleasure of this book and, and others that I have done is being able to weave in some of those experiences and use some of those people in a different way and the things that I learned from them and recognizing their gratitude stories and their abilities to be humble and, uh, and to realize that celebrities, you know, we all look at celebrities and we go, yeah, of course they should be grateful. They're celebrities. But hey, how many people are looking at you or me or anybody out there listening and saying, well, why aren't you grateful? You know, there are so many people who have less than all of us and, and all of your listeners. And if we look at it from that perspective, I think it, it changes how we think about, about others too. Totally agree with you. And when I've read some of the things that people wrote about the book when the book came out, there was this theme, which I guess I hadn't thought of, which was, Janice is so successful. She'd done all these things. Why wasn't she more grateful? At what point in doing the research and writing the book did that sort of hit you and surprise you? Or maybe it didn't. Well, you know, it's not that I've ever been ungrateful. I've always tried to appreciate my life. And I've always, uh, when my kids were little, we used to, once a week before dinner, we would have a, let's talk about something good that happened this week. So I always had a positive attitude. But I think what I started to realize as I was writing the book is that how we see our lives and the events that happen in our lives really our, our attitudes do matter so much. And how people see us from the outside is not how any of us see ourselves from the inside. And what really matters is how we do see ourselves from the inside. And that's what I was suggesting about some of those celebrities that we are all looking at. Well, they're living their lives and maybe they're not being grateful because whatever you experience becomes your baseline. Psychologists refer to it as habituation. You get used to stuff. And so whatever you have in terms of your job, your life, your family, your experiences, that becomes your baseline. And it becomes very easy to always think about wanting more rather than stopping to say, this is great what I have right now. And I think one of the things that I learned 
and stress in the book and in the podcast that I do now is saying that being grateful doesn't mean you can't want more. It doesn't mean you can't be ambitious and continue to be successful, but it means that you're going to stop with what you do have at the moment and say, I do appreciate this. I'm happy where I am right now. And maybe next month, next week, next year, I'll have something different and I'll stop and appreciate that too. But it is that matter of of appreciating where you are when you're there. The concept of gratitude is one that is so simple, but so difficult to change a mindset. And you're such a natural guest on this podcast because so many of the people who have come on who have gone through some really difficult things. And this podcast is all about people who flip their script, change the narrative, change the storyline. And some of these people who have come out the other side and are motivating other people, inspiring other people, changing laws, whatever it might be, they go back, a lot of them, to gratitude and being grateful even in the difficult time because it always could be worse. And when you get notes from people and you hear from people, is it people who are in the midst of like trauma that are looking at this book or is it people who have a lot to be grateful for and just need a mindset shift? I think it's very much both. And I certainly make it clear in the book that I knew I had a good life. I wasn't pretending that anything was wrong. And I was using gratitude to go from good to better. And I think a lot of people want to do that and want to be able to do that. And I am in awe of the people who I spoke to for the book and who I meet when I'm traveling who have used gratitude, as you suggest, to get through truly terrible, terrible times. And so often in in the days I could still give talks in person, uh, people would come up to me afterwards and often they would tell me just dreadful stories um, of death, of tragedy, of illness and, and family tragedies and tell me how gratitude had gotten them through or how reading about gratitude and trying to be more positive had gotten them through. And I am, as I said, in awe of people who are able to do that. But I think when we have the practice of being able to do it, whatever our conditions are, then maybe it does become easier when those really tough moments arise. And they arise for everyone, whether you like it or not, at some point. That's so true. And if 2020 taught us anything, it's that we all can go through something really difficult. And even in the midst of difficult time, there are still things to be grateful for. And it's disappointing to me when people talk about gratitude a lot around Thanksgiving, and then it sort of goes away and then it comes back at Thanksgiving time. And really, there's it, it's like you said, a practice of thankfulness and gratefulness. In the book, you write about the gratitude gap. For people who haven't read the book, can you talk about what that is and why it's important? Sure. When I started the book, I did a national survey on gratitude. I mentioned that a foundation had come to me and asked me to do that survey. And that's, that's how the whole project began. And when the results started coming in, they were really interesting. And one of the things that particularly struck me was that about 90, 95% of people said that they thought grateful people were happier. And when asked to whether they were grateful for family and friends, they said, absolutely. Again, 90, 95% of people said grateful for family and friends. And then we asked, do you express gratitude? And all of a sudden the number plunged and it was less than half, it was about 45%. So I started thinking of that as the gratitude gap, that on the one hand we have something that we know deep in our hearts is going to make us happier, but on the other hand, we don't do it. And part of the impetus for me for the gratitude diaries for the book was realizing that I was as guilty as the, of the gratitude gap as anybody else and trying to see what would happen if I spent a year trying to close that gap and trying to live more gratefully. For people who are interested in this concept, but it sounds maybe kind of big or they don't know where to start, what's the first step? What's the first thing someone can do to live a more grateful life? Well, there's so many steps, and, and, and I think gratitude is really about reframing a situation. It's really just about recognizing that there are events you can control and events you can't. If there's something you can change in your life, go ahead and change it. But when there are other situations, just try to look at them from a different perspective. One of the ways I suggest of starting a gratitude habit and thinking about gratitude is to put a little scrap of paper next to your bed. And tell yourself that every night you're going to write down one thing that you were grateful for that day. 
one thing. It's not a big deal. And it doesn't have to be a big fancy gratitude journal, even though, of course, that's what I did when I was writing the book. But I know gratitude journals can start to sound like a chore to some people. You know, you're busy all day. You don't want to go home and write essays. So put that scrap of paper next to your bed. And how does that work? Well, you're going to wake up tomorrow morning and you're going to look outside and it's going to be a beautiful day of snow falling. And you're going to say, oh, I'm so grateful for this beautiful, beautiful snowfall. Ah, grateful, done for the day. And that's okay because it's put you in a positive mind frame for the rest of the day. Or it's going to get to be four o'clock in the afternoon and you have not been grateful for anything. And you're going to remember that scrap of paper next to your bed and that Jana said you have to write something down tonight. And so you're going to pause and you're going to just take two minutes and look around and you're going to say, oh, I'm grateful that I'm having pizza for dinner tonight. I'm grateful that I have this furry pair of slippers or I'm grateful that there's a pretty plant on my windowsill. It doesn't matter what, you'll find something. And once again, just that taking the moment to be grateful, to think differently, starts to teach you to reframe the situation, to think about your day and each moment a little differently. And that night before bed, you're going to scribble down those couple of words, and it's going to remind you all over again to do that and of what made you grateful that day. And I think it's a wonderful way to start. If you have children, do that with them too. Before bed, Ask them what made them happy that day. If they're too little, they might not understand the word gratitude, but they know that something good happened that day. Talk to kids about it at dinner. Again, don't make it a chore. Don't make it a big deal. But just after you hear the complaints about how terrible things were and all of the awful things that ha things happened, don't you don't have to dismiss them. You can deal with them. You can talk about them. And you can say, yep, that was all really rotten. Now let's think about something good that happened because something good must have happened today too. And what a gift we give ourselves and our children if we can start to think of our days as balanced and as being able to be seen through both lenses. Excellent, excellent stuff. You as a person, how are you different today than had you never done the project, never done the research, never written the book? You know, perfectly honestly, I don't think I am naturally always positive and grateful. I can be as grumpy as anybody else. I can pick fights with my, you know, with, with, with the people I love, but I've stopped that so much, or I recognize when it's happening, or I wake up in the morning and I realize, what can I do to be happy today? Because nobody wakes up thinking, I'm going to be miserable today. That's what I would like to be. But we don't realize how we do that to ourselves and how we look at things in, in a negative perspective too often. So I think that I have taught myself to actually sometimes physically stop and think, what makes me happy here? How can I be grateful here? I've certainly also become so much more thankful to other people and to recognizing other people and sometimes just a very genuine thank you or boy, I really appreciate that you uh, that you brought that package all the way to my door instead of leaving it at the at the end of the driveway. Somebody responds to that and they're surprised to hear it and it gives you pleasure in saying it also. I think that's probably the greatest lesson of gratitude is that when we express gratitude, we think we're doing something for somebody else. We think we're giving a gift to somebody else by thanking them, but really we're giving a gift to ourselves by making ourselves more positive and appreciative. And gratitude is catchy. It's one of those things where if you say something nice to the person who brought the box up and they're a little bit lighter and they say something to the next person, it can be one of those domino effect kind of things that just makes everybody's day better. So if you have the power with your words to make everybody's day better, why not use them? Absolutely. And I talk in the book about how often we bond by complaining. We, you know, you're stand talking with your friends or you're standing at the bus stop and, and you find something to complain about, you know, the awful weather, the, oh, isn't this a terrible situation? And uh, we just bond by complaining. And I talk in the book about how I noticed that and I made a big effort to just turn the conversation around. So if somebody would say, oh, it's another freezing day here, I would say, yeah, I have this great recipe for hot chocolate. Do you want me to send it to you? It's so good. And all of a sudden you're bonding over hot chocolate and people are just as happy to do that. Sometimes they're just looking for a way to connect and unfortunately our natural 
form of connection too often is that complaining. So you're right, it is contagious. And when you start being positive, you start being less tolerant, I must admit, of people who are constantly negative. And I find that what I do is I am relentlessly positive to them, hoping that they'll pick up the message. And often they do. That's wonderful. And in thinking about your career since the Gratitude Diaries, and I don't know if you ever get sick and tired of talking about gratitude or the book, because you've done so many different things. I want to talk about your new book, The Genius of Women, which I have. What was the backstory and why you wanted to write this book? Well, I've been interested in women's issues for much of my career. Actually, the very first book I wrote the year I graduated college was called Women in Sports. And the uh, the impetus, the specific impetus for this was also a survey, just as it was with gratitude. Actually, the same the same friend and pollster, Mike Berland, who's a very well known strategist and pollster, had done a survey where he had asked people various questions, but one of them was about genius. And he discovered that ninety percent of Americans said that geniuses tend to be men. And when asked to name a female genius, virtually the only person anybody could come up with was Marie Curie. And we went out to lunch one day and Mike said to me, what do you think is going on here? Why would that be? And I really had no idea, but the question just completely intrigued me. So I spent the next two years (laughs) trying to come up with an answer to it. And it was along with gratitude. I've written a lot of books, but gratitude and the genius of women are the two that have been really closest to my heart and most important to me. In The Genius of Women, I got to look at women historically who have been forgotten and why that is and what their stories are. And I got to interview dozens of fabulous women doing things, amazing work right now. As with The Gratitude Diaries, I the book is not a collection of interviews by any means. It's It's taking readers along on my journey of discovery and of trying to understand why women aren't seen as geniuses, why they haven't been, what makes a woman extraordinary, and how is it that despite all the obstacles in their way, some women in every generation have managed to achieve so much and soar so high? And what is it that makes them different? And what can we all learn from them about our own lives and what the potentials are for ourselves and and our children? Well, this topic is one that is fascinating to me, and I I read a lot of stories about women and women who have been overlooked. Hedy Lamarr, for example. If you don't know who Hedy Lamarr is, listeners, go to Wikipedia. There's some great books, but there's all these women that have done really incredible things. It wasn't until after either they died or many years later that they were even recognized for what they did. So I did a little experiment last night at dinner. And I I encourage other people to do it as well. So I have two sons. One son was home. He's 13 at dinner. Uh, My husband and I said, tell me, name some geniuses for me. My son started with Steph Curry, Michael Jordan. He went sports. And I said, okay, sports, yes. Let's talk about someone else outside of sports because he was just going through sports. That's how his, that's his worldview. So he started going Elon Musk and Nikolai Tesla and it's that, that realm. And then I said to my husband, okay, what do you think? And he said, Albert Einstein. And then he, I could see his face switch. And he was like, mm, I know my wife, she's looking for a woman here. <laughs> and I bet there was a pause for like, like two minutes. And he said, Jane Austen. And my children, my husband, like we were all, you know, I, I can't speak for them feminists, but believe that women are capable of so many things. It's really true, though, in history, it's hard to come up with names. It's difficult. Well, bravo to your husband for trying. <laughs> and, and I think when you read the book, you discover it's not that hard to come up with the names. There are lots of them. And so many people have written to me about this book saying, I'm so embarrassed that I didn't know who these people were before. And I say, don't be embarrassed. That's the whole point of the book. I didn't know who they were either. And I didn't know so many of these extraordinary women doing work right now. But I think beyond the fact of how women have been overlooked before, it's more dramatic than that even, is that in many cases they have actually been purposefully written out of history, that they did the great work. And maybe in their time, they were even recognized. And then there was an effort by the men in power to write them out of history. And I was fairly shocked by that. And I think I came to the conclusion 
that perhaps what sets women and men apart as geniuses more than anything, more than talent, more than hard work, more than natural ability, is the ability to set the rules and the ability to define what genius is and who is a genius. And once women start to have more positions of power, I think our definition of genius and of who that includes is going to start to change very dramatically. Fast Company wrote something about the book, and I want to read a portion of the book that they quoted because I, I, th I think it's, it's awesome. So this is right from your book. Real issue separating men and women isn't talent or achievement or natural brilliance or hard work. It's being in the position to set the rules. Men have had the, that power and women have not. Men have been making the decisions about what is good and what matters and their biases become the status quo, the accepted ethos for all. And it's, it's exactly what you were just talking about. I think it's, it's, interesting to think about it that way because currently most of us are surrounded by men who we wouldn't think would say, you know what I'm going to do today? I'm going to, I'm going to take credit for that and I'm going to write her out of history. So do you think that these men that were doing this did it intentionally? Was it just their normal? Was it the way they grew up? Was it how society treated women? Or was it like a conscious effort to say, nope, they don't get the credit? I think it's both. And um, I actually tell the story in the book of two women, the two women who discovered CRISPR, which is a way of genetic manipulation, uh, Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier. And it was an extraordinary discovery just a couple of years ago. And I tell the long story in the book of the true effort, and it was a very blatant effort of men who were also working in that field of trying to diminish them. And fortunately, this was a case where it was pretty clear to many what was going on. As I was watching it, though, I describe it in the book as sort of sitting on the sidelines of history, wondering what was going to happen. After my book was published, they went ahead and won the Nobel Prize. And uh, fortunately, I get to update that book. The, the paperback of The Genius of Women comes out in February, and, and it has an update on that story. But it was a particularly shocking story to me because it was so blatant and it was a power struggle. And I'm not sure that the men did it simply because they were women. They wanted to win the Nobel Prize. The other guys wanted to win the Nobel Prize or wanted their, their researchers to win the Nobel Prize rather than the women. But it somehow made it easier because they were fighting against women. I think what has happened is that we have replaced old stereotypes with new stereotypes. And the unconscious bias remains very deep, that there are differences between men and women. And so maybe we no longer think of women as just the, per the woman behind the man or that a woman can't achieve something, but we have new stereotypes. We say, oh, women are cooperative and collegial, and that's why we should hire them. Is that true? Well... I know women who are cooperative and collegial. I know men who are cooperative and collegial. I know women who aren't, and I know men who aren't. So I think as soon as we start putting people in buckets, we diminish who they are and what some of the great possibilities are for all of us. Absolutely. And I think there's a also a tendency to think that these types of things don't happen anymore or to say, well, that's, that's history. And even the the example you just shared is current, uh, but I'm fascinated. If you really ask the question to people and ask women specifically, have you ever encountered this kind of bias? Have you ever felt diminished by a man? The stories that come out are really quite incredible. I have a very good friend and she was a very talented woman invited to a meeting, an important meeting, a lot of men in the room, two women. There were name tags on all of the seats. The two women, back row, by themselves, behind all the men. And those types of things, they happen more than I think folks want to admit or even acknowledge or are aware of. And oftentimes, I don't know that men are even aware of it, which goes back to the unconscious bias. I recently, I'm on a, a couple of boards and there was a committee and there were all men and I, I, asked, I asked the president, is there a reason that there aren't any women on that committee? I didn't even realize it. So I think all of us have to just maybe have our eyes open to 
gender, representation, race, this brings up a lot of different things as well when we talk about representation. But it is so important to think about the women who have made such a difference because we look to our younger generation. (laughs) These little girls cannot be what they don't see. So sharing stories like yours and all these women in the book, it's just so important. So important. Well, thank you. Um, I think it is too. And I think we don't realize just what messages our children are taking in and how dramatically early they're taking in those messages. Things have changed, absolutely. Things have gotten better. But I but I tell the story in the book of a researcher at Princeton named Sarah Jane Leslie, who is also one of the deans at Princeton. And um, she did a survey where she invited small children into her lab. And she told them a story about somebody who was very, very smart. And then she showed them pictures. Two of the pictures were of men and two of the pictures were of women. And she asked them, who's the story about? And up until the age of five, the children picked the person who looked like them. The little boys picked one of the men and the little girls picked one of the women. And then at age six, it changed. And the little boys picked one of the men and the little girls picked one of the men. And Sarah Jane Leslie said she didn't know exactly what changed at age six, other than that all those social messages that are out there start to become more and more apparent to kids. And all those girl power t-shirts that you're putting on your daughters aren't really fighting that strong sense that, nope, it's the boys who are going to be the smart ones and the boys who are going to be in control and the boys who are going to have the power. And by the way, the interesting thing is that at age five or six, it's usually the girls who are somewhat smarter in school than the boys are. So yes, I think things have changed, but I think we have to be aware of the messages that we're sending consciously and unconsciously and, uh, and to really want to change them. Because that's the other thing I started to recognize is that some people don't want to change them. We don't mind those messages. And uh, if that's the case, they're just going to persist. And people who would say, things like, well, in the past, it was all the men that were geniuses, they were the one out working. That's a lie. That's not true. And your book very much says that, that there have been women who have been making a difference and been changing the world for decades, centuries, they just might not be in the history books. There are structural issues that women have to get through. And sometimes women have to work around those structural issues. I tell the story in the book of Fanny Mendelssohn, who was a a great composer and pianist. And she was the sister of Felix Mendelssohn, who most people know because he is also a famous composer. And when she was a young teenager, about 14 years old, she was out performing with her brother and her dad told her, time's up, you have to go home and get married now. And you you can't be, music can only be a hobby for you from now on. And Fanny did go home and she did get married. She didn't really have much choice at, at that time. And she continued composing though. And she composed dozens and hundreds of pieces of music and she published them under Felix's name. So women were doing great work but truly not being noticed. And it was only much later after her death that it was discovered how much of Felix's work really was Fanny's work. Which women of current times do you think in 20 years, 50 years, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren will look back and say, those were the female geniuses, or let's hope they don't even have to say female. They'll just say, those were the geniuses of our time. Who do we need to know right now that we may not know? Well, several people who I interviewed are are quite amazing. One of the great experts in artificial intelligence is Fei-Fei Li, who's a professor at Stanford, a young woman in her 40s who has done unbelievable work in teaching computers how to see. Her work is really completely transformed artificial intelligence. It's used for so many different things now, including teaching cars, self-driving cars, I'm not sure a lot of people know Fei-Fei Li's name. There's an extraordinary chemist named Frances Arnold who did win the Nobel Prize in Chemistry a couple of years ago. She completely upended how we think about chemistry. She found a new way to create proteins and enzymes in a lab that had never been done before. 
it takes decades to win a Nobel Prize. And when she started the work 30 years ago, she was quite a young woman. And everybody was telling her she was wrong and that it couldn't be done and that what she was doing was crazy. And I said to her, how did you have the courage to go on? How did you have the courage to keep trying that? And she said, I did not doubt myself. And I just loved that line. And I thought, boy, can you imagine what all of us could do if we were able to say, I did not doubt myself? We've been talking a lot about really accomplished women, but the mindset of don't doubt yourself, boy, we'd be better mothers, we'd be better wives, we'd be better whatever it might, friends, fill in the blank, because not everyone is genius or wants to be genius or aspires to genius. However, the don't doubt yourself is a message that can apply to everyone. And just like gratitude, those two, both of those things really can make an impact for good all the way around. Absolutely. And, you know, tying the the gratitude and genius together, one of the traits I found over and over again in the genius women I interviewed was a great spirit of positivity. Not just the, I don't doubt myself, but looking for the good and knowing that there were obstacles, but ignoring them and finding the people who could help them and not worrying about the people who stood in their way. So once again, I think that mindset of looking for the good, of trying to be positive, of finding the things that are really going to help you in life makes a huge difference for you, whatever you're doing. And as you said, whatever role you're playing, you don't have to be the most extraordinary in your field. You just have to have that attitude of positivity and and sense of purpose. I wrap up the interview. And before I ask the final question, what's your next big project? Can you tell us? (laughs) Well, I am working on another book, but it's too soon to talk about it. And right now I'm just so enjoying uh, getting to talk about the genius of women, which, as I said, is about to come out in paperback. So getting getting another life uh, since it came out right in the midst of the pandemic and gratitude also continues. And I'm doing the gratitude podcast uh, three times a week for iHeartMedia. So that's been that's been fun, too. And we'll put all of the links to, you've got a couple websites and the podcast and books and all of that. We'll put that on the Flip Your Script podcast uh, website as well so that people can easily find it in one place. I really appreciate the messages you're bringing out because whether it's gratitude, the genius of women, some of the other work that you've done, they're important and and they're not hard. Some kind of change your mindset things are are big and it takes a year and you did spend a year with the gratitude diaries but you can easily make some minor tweaks even in how you think about gender how you think about a word like genius and make a big difference so I really appreciate that about your work and I I really look forward to seeing what you're up to next because I suspect it will be fantastic well thank you and it's it is a pleasure to get to talk to you about these and and you're right I think that there are there are small tweaks that all of us can make to make ourselves happier and our lives better and our achievements more interesting to to us and others. And as we wrap up, Janice, is there a quote or mantra that helped you as you either dealt with difficult times or, or thought about flipping your script as you have done several times in your career and you certainly have helped other people in their lives? Well, as I was working on the Gratitude Diaries, I spent a lot of time reading the Greek philosophers, including the Stoics. And we now think of Stoic as meaning, you know, somebody who's just very firm and unemotional. And that's not what the Stoics were at all. The Stoics believed in being realistic and finding ways to be happy within the world that exists. One of the Greek philosophers, Epictetus, had the wonderful line that people are disturbed not by events, but by the views which they take of them. And I think that's really important for us to understand. It's not the events that are going to change our lives, but how we look at them. And that really helps me get through and I think can help anybody get through in any situation. And there's another quote that I used to start one of the chapters of the Gratitude Diaries from a very different source than an ancient Greek philosopher. It was from the newsroom on HBO, an old TV show. And one of the characters said, on the off chance that you won't live forever, maybe you should try being happy now. Great advice. And I hadn't thought about how the two books really tie together, but it is this reframing, reframing of mindset, reframing of history, reframing of how you look at the world. And that can make a big difference, not just for you, but for all those around you. Thank you so much, Janice. It's been a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Wonderful to talk with you. Thank you so much. 
Janice said so many powerful things and has written about some really important topics. And the takeaways for me, the mindset of gratitude, one that we all can do better in. But I think in this podcast, sometimes we have these really big stories and maybe even difficult to relate to. But the concept of going from good to better, your life, your mindset, your relationships, even if they're great, they could be excellent. What can you do and how can you think to take your mindset from one level to the next level. And if we did that every year, where would we be in 10 years? And to look for good, there's always good to be seen in people and places and times and history. Don't doubt yourself. That's an incredible message and an incredible way to live. And finally, Francis Arnold, Fei Fei Li, women, you need to know, you need to remember, tell someone else about them and what they're doing. My hope is that Janice's story empowers you to believe you're capable of more than you think, to discover motivation, to uncover inspiration, and to find the strength to turn the page. Thank you for listening to Flip Your Script, hosted by Christy Peel and produced by Media Minefield. If you like our message, please be sure to give us a five-star rating, subscribe to the show, and share our episodes with your family and friends. Do you or someone you know have a story about flipping your script? We'd love to share it. Contact us on our website, flipyourscriptpodcast.com. To stay up to date on all things Flip Your Script, make sure to follow host Christy Peel on social media. You can also check out the website for pictures, resources mentioned in the show, and other great episodes.